What's up guys, Kudokun here, and you're about to watch the review for a neat little card game I got sent called Warriors of the Crystal. Now the creator was nice enough to not only send me both of the starter decks, but also, check this out, two unopened booster packs. So if you enjoy the review, stick around till the end, we'll open these bad boys up and see what I got. Stay tuned. Hey, any of you guys ever get nostalgic for the old Final Fantasy games? <gasps> What's that? All of you? All of the time? Well, luckily a card game's come along to try and scratch that itch. As you can probably tell by the name, Warriors of the Crystal is meant to be a love letter to fans of classic RPGs. The question is, is it a critical hit or a critical miss? Let's find out together. Let's start by taking a look at units. At the top of the card, you'll see the card's name and card type. Unit cards are already fairly easy to tell apart from other cards because they're red, but you can also see that it says unit card at the top of the card for your convenience. There's also a small symbol of a sword next to the card name. Units will fall into one of three categories, a warrior, a mage, or a dual type who will have both. This affects some of the cards they'll be interacting with later in the game. The HP and power of the card will be located here under the picture. While HP does of course refer to hit points, it also has another important interaction with the game in that if this character is defeated at any point, you lose 60 crystal points. You'll start the game with 200 crystal points, so if this character were to be defeated, you would have 140, and it would continue like this until you went down to zero. And finally we have the effect text. Every unit will have some kind of effect. Most effects will take place during one of the three phases of the game, named Battle Phase 1, 2, and 3. Though once in a while you will see different timings on cards, such as during opponent's turn and always active. Next, let's take a look at combat cards. As you can see here at the top, the card name and card type are still here. You'll also notice a wand instead of a sword. This is where unit types come into play. A warrior cannot use this card because it's meant for spellcasters. This also works in reverse. If the card we looked at before were a mage type and this were a warrior type combat card, then again, it wouldn't be usable. This blue symbol here represents the card's mana cost. Currently, the highest mana cost in the game is 3, and every combat card will cost at least 1. While units can perform a basic attack dealing their regular power to an enemy, you'll want to be using combat cards as much as possible to deal as much damage as possible, so managing your mana will be an important skill. You'll also see some crystal symbols here to the right that dictate how many targets the spell can hit. Since one crystal is lighting up, this is a single target spell, though some spells are powerful enough to hit two or even three characters at once. Behind the card's effect text, you'll notice this symbol that looks a little bit fiery. Some combat cards will be tied into an elemental affinity. For example, Blaze is tied into fire. It's a bit much to get into right now, but just know that elemental affinity is a way to deal much more damage to your opponent, while also taking more damage in some cases. And finally, we have the actual effect of the card. Blaze deals plus 9 HP of damage. Now the reason it says plus 9 is because you add the base value of your unit's power to this card's power. So if we had a power of 7 for example, this would deal 16 damage. Next up are what we call crystal cards. Crystal cards, ironically enough, have nothing to do with your crystal points. Crystal cards for the most part are one-time use cards that give you a variety of effects. Some of these effects include getting to draw more cards, getting more mana, so on and so forth. Combat Specialist would allow one of our unit cards to use a combat card regardless of its unit type that turn. You want a spellcasting knight? You got a spellcasting knight! These cards can only be used during your battle phase 1, and so far I haven't seen any that activate during your opponent's turn. Finally, we have ambush cards. Now, I'll try to avoid any Yu-Gi-Oh comparisons, but they are essentially trap cards. They're played face down and then flipped face up whenever their conditions are met. In the case of Speak No Evil, it flips face up when your opponent tries to use a unit ability or combat card. The unit that tried to use the card or ability is inflicted with silence. We'll talk a bit more about status effects later in the video. Now that we know the cards, let's learn the game. Your deck should be a minimum of 40 cards, though feel free to add more than 40 if you prefer. Your deck must include at least 3 unit cards of different names. 
and you're allowed four copies of any one named card within your deck. If your deck meets these requirements, then you're ready to play. Take two units with different names from your deck and set them in front of you, and then shuffle your deck and set it to the side. All players will start the game with one mana. Now decide who's going first using a random method. A roll of the dice or rock, paper, scissors would probably work best. Once that's decided, draw your opening hand of five cards. There are no official mulligan rules in Warriors of the Crystal, but feel free to work something out with your opponent. I won't tell if you won't. And we're finally ready to start. Unlike other card games, going first doesn't really give you a disadvantage, so you'll want to go first as often as possible. Draw one card and give yourself one mana. If any of our characters had been poisoned, then our first action would have been to give them 10 damage. However, because it's the beginning of the game, chances are they're not poisoned. Now that our battle phase 1 has started proper, there's a variety of things we can do. This will be the biggest phase of our turn. If you have less than 3 units, you can put another one in play. Once a unit card is in play, it's not going anywhere until it's defeated, so make sure that third slot is filled with something that you want. You can start playing crystal cards, though some of them do have restrictions like spoils of battle, which can only be played once per turn. You can play an ambush card by putting it face down on the field. Do keep in mind you can only have three ambushes in play at once, and absolutely no duplicates of ambushes can be in play at the same time. If any of your characters are afflicted with status ailments, you can pay to have them removed. You can pay two mana to remove them from one character, three mana to remove them from two characters, or four mana to remove them from three characters. A lot of unit cards will have a battle phase one effect. For example, the knight can discard one card from your hands to give him plus five damage if he uses a warrior type combat card this turn. To my knowledge, these effects can only be used once per turn. And lastly, if you don't have any characters in play, you can choose to perform a unit summoning. To unit summon, pay 20 CP and then flip cards from the top of your deck over until you hit a unit card. All cards flipped over in this way are discarded, and the first unit you hit will come into play. Keep in mind that doing this will end your turn, so make sure there aren't any crystal cards or ambushes or anything else you want to do during your turn before you perform a unit summoning. Let's move on to an example of Battle Phase 2. Despite the three phases being called battle phases, this is technically the only phase where any battling will be taking place. We'll be playing as the Cleric, Wizard, and Rune Knight there on the left, while our opponent will be playing as the Monk, Paladin, and Ninja on the right. Now during our battle phase 2, we are allowed one action for every character that we have in play, so right now we have three characters in play and each of them can take one action for a total of three actions. The actions will vary between three choices. The first action we can take is actually using an ability on one of our cards. The Cleric, for example, can use their action to remove status effects and heal one ally. Another action a character has is to perform a basic attack. The Rune Knight, for example, has 8 power, so you can do a basic attack of 8 damage to one of your opponent's unit cards. But by far the most common action you should be taking is using a combat card. Despite taking mana, combat cards are the cards you should be aiming to use the most, because they deal much more damage than just using basic attacks over and over again. The Rune Knight we looked at before had a total of 8 power, and this deals plus 9 damage, so this is dealing more than double the damage by just paying 1 mana. But there's another reason you'll want to use combat cards, and it has to do with elemental affinity. I did say we would talk about this, so let's talk about it. You can use crystal cards to give your units an affinity. The Fire Elemental, for example, gives one of our units, you guessed it, the Fire Affinity. A stretch of the imagination, I know. A unit with an Elemental Affinity gets a couple of really neat bonuses. First of all, their base power goes up by 2, so that Rune Knight we looked at earlier with 8 power would actually have 10 base power instead. Secondly, when you use an Elemental Attack of the same affinity, you get a plus 6 modifier to its damage, so this isn't just plus 9 damage, it's plus 15 damage, which is a lot more. And lastly, if you attack a unit of an opposing element, then you deal plus 6 more damage on top of that. There are 8 elements that oppose each other. Light opposes Dark, Fire opposes Ice, Lightning opposes Water, and Earth opposes Wind. The sneaky thing about this is you can use one of these elemental cards to change the element of your opponent's character. So, if we were to change one of our opponents into an ice element, and change ourselves into a fire element, 
and then use a fire combat card on top of that, then we would be dealing a whopping plus 14 damage on top of the base damage of the combat card we're using. This is the most efficient way to spend an attack. It gives you the most value and it's pretty easy to set up. Let's go back to our example and assume that our wizard has the fire affinity and our opponent's ninja has the ice affinity. I'm going to spend one mana to play Blaze, now let's see how much damage we deal. We have a plus 9 modifier from Blaze itself, plus 6 because I'm fire affinity, and then plus 6 more because my opponent's ice affinity, so that brings us up to 21 so far. And the wizard normally has 7 power, but has 9 right now because it has an elemental affinity, so we're at a total of 30 power. Another thing to note is that during our battle phase 1, we could have discarded a card from our hand to deal 5 more damage, which would have been 35, but for the sake of argument, we'll say we skipped it. Taking a look at the ninja's HP, you'll notice they've only got 60, so being able to deal 30 damage in one attack is actually a pretty major thing. Something you'll want to be careful of, though, is our opponent's ninja effect. He can discard two cards from his hand to negate all of the damage we would have dealt, which he might actually want to do in this case because he'd be halfway to death. Even though this strategy is effective, you'll want to pick your targets carefully. Hey, what's up guys? This is Kudo from the future. Uh, I'm actually going back and editing this video and I realize now that I actually misread one of the rules. You do not get the plus two bonus for having an elemental affinity if you're using a combat card, it's only for basic attacks. So the damage would actually be 28, but I do want to stand by the fact that you could have discarded a card from your hand to make the damage 33. So even though past Kudo is really dumb, I think his point still stands. Alright, I'll, uh, I'll let him get back to it. Now that we're in battle phase 3, we just have to deal with cleanup. If any of your opponent's units were defeated, then subtract their max HP from their remaining crystal points. So if our opponent had their full 200 crystal points and we defeated the paladin, they would lose 70. Any effects that say until the end of the turn should end now. If any of your units have been suffering from a status effect for 3 turns, then they are healed of those status ailments now. So what are my thoughts on the game? I do enjoy the idea of it. I think the idea of having a party-based sort of old-school RPG system could work really well. I like the inclusion of things like elemental affinities to give the game a bit more depth. I enjoy the idea of combat cards, though I wish they were handled a little bit differently. And overall, I think all of the ideas for a good card game are here. The artwork is great. The card quality is phenomenal. In fact, the only thing wrong with the cards that I received is uh, the game came with tokens, and the tokens got a little bit of soot on them because they were uh, laser cut. But honestly, if you just wipe them off with a paper towel or something, they shouldn't even last that long. So quality-wise, the game is definitely in the higher standards. The game can be pretty fast-paced, and one thing that I want to say about the game that I think is pretty amazing is... Nobody was confused on the rules at any point. We had a pretty easy time teaching everybody of pretty much every age, and honestly, anybody of any age could enjoy this game. Nothing is that daunting or confusing, and it wasn't so simple that the older players I showed the game to were bored with it at any point. However, this is the part of the review where I go into my brutal honesty mode. Unfortunately, there are a lot of negatives with this game that I do have to talk about. I don't want you to think I'm attacking this game out of a place of hate or something. I've talked to the creator of the game, they're a really cool person. The game is definitely a passion project with a lot of love and care put into it. But unfortunately, there are just so many clunky things surrounding the game that the game is going to have to make a lot of improvements to actually become a viable competitive card game. And make no mistake, the game is in a severely broken and difficult to play state. Try not to take this too negatively, just because the technical side of the game is in a really rough, difficult to play state, everybody who plays it on Facebook seems so happy and that's the sort of experience I had showing the game to people too. A game can have a lot of technical shortcomings and still be a fun game to pick up and play with somebody. But my job right now is to be a critic of the game and be honest about it so the game can improve and evolve. 
I'm going to split this criticism up into three sections. First, I'm going to talk about what the biggest things holding this game back right now are. Then I'm going to talk about what I sort of would have done differently with the game had I been in charge of making the game mechanics. And third, I'm going to talk about what the game can do to further itself without changing up what they currently have too much. So current problems, what I would have done, how we move forward. Ready? Let's begin. First of all, the card design sort of reeks of amateur. This isn't to say anything about the artwork, but I'm talking about the actual effects of the cards themselves. I'm going to name off some cards and their card effects, and if you happen to be somebody in the audience who plays card games regularly or consider yourself a pretty serious or semi-serious card game player, let me know what your thoughts are about these cards I'm about to read off in the comment section below and tell me if you find any problems. Replenish. If you have less than 5 cards in your hand, draw cards until you have 5 cards in your hand. The Deus Crystal. Discard 3 cards from your hands, and then all of your combat cards deal plus 6 damage this turn. Karm. Discard 2 cards from your hands. All of your combat cards cost 1 less mana this turn, if they are warrior type combat cards. Mana Surge 2. Discard two cards from your hands to give yourself plus two mana. Regroup. Shuffle your current hand into your deck and draw five cards. Alright, so again, your alarm bell should be going off, but just wait. It gets better, guys. Unrestricted search authorized. Search your deck for any one card and add it to your hand and reshuffle your deck afterwards. Ordinance Retrieval. Search your deck for any one crystal card and add it to your hand, reshuffle your deck afterwards. Now, I could go on with even more cards, but I think we all get the point. The main problem with the game are the crystal cards. The crystal cards give the player way too much freedom and they make the game easier to break than a piece of glass toilet paper. By the way, please don't use glass as toilet paper, that sounds painful. I understand where the creator's coming from with this kind of design decision, because, for one, this does work in games like the Pokemon TCG, but the problem is the Pokemon TCG has very hard and restrictive limits on how they let players do this. If anybody doesn't know the Pokemon TCG metagame, essentially, your goal is to try and play on two hands of cards per turn. So you start with one hand and you use cards like Ultra Ball, or other cards like uh, Energy Search that let you discard cards from your hands to get more cards, and then when you're finally done with your hand, you play a card that either lets you shuffle your hand back into your deck and draw a new one, or discard your hand and draw a new one. But the cards that actually give you a new hand are highly, highly restricted. You can only use one per turn, and there are some times where you don't want to use it because it locks you out of playing something else that's very powerful. I've read over the crystal section multiple times to make sure I'm not misreading something, but you can just kind of play all of these cards all of the time, and you have four copies of each in your deck, so you can honestly just continuously do this over and over and over again, and again, it makes the game far too easy to break. The reason that I said earlier that this sort of reeks of amateurishness is if you ask anybody literally anybody who plays card games regularly about these cards and you hand them to them, then they could tell you immediately, before the card game's even made, that this is going to end up as a really, really awful idea because it's going to create a very toxic and unfun advantage for a meta player. The only way to get you to understand how truly magnificently broken the crystal card system is in this game, I'm going to give you a live demonstration. For this practice example, I'll be using this deck list that I put together. As you can see, I've created myself a bit of a proxy deck that should illustrate some of the points that I'm making in my video. So what I'm going to do in real life is go through an actual practice hand of this game using these index cards, but I'll animate everything that I'm doing on screen and explain what all of the cards are doing. Alright, so firstly I'll be starting off with the Knight and Rune Knight. We get one mana at the beginning of the game, and then of course I get a second mana because I'm going first, and I get one mana at the beginning of my turn. 
just gonna shuffle this bad boy up here. Um, honestly, it doesn't really matter what I'm gonna draw for my opening hand. I've run this experiment so many times, it's very, very difficult to believe that I'll fail it on this one, but we will see what happens. Okay, so my opening hand is gonna be Ice, Fire, two Ordinance Retrieval, and one Scouring Skills. And again, I will explain what all these cards do as I'm playing them. And I will now draw one card for the beginning of my turn. It's our combat card, Burning Spirit. I'll use Scouring Skills to search my deck for a combat card and put it in my hand. The only combat card I'm using is Burning Spirit. I'll use Fire on my Rune Knight to give it the Fire element, and I will use Ice on one of my opponent's characters. We'll assume they have the Rune Knight and the Paladin since they're the highest HP characters, and I want to assume that I'm in the weakest position possible. So I will use Fire on my Rune Knight and Ice on their Rune Knight. I'll use one Ordinance Retrieval to search my deck for a Mana Surge 2. I'll play Mana Surge 2 by discarding the two Burning Spirits in my hands, which will give me plus two mana. Then I'll use the last Ordinance Retrieval to search my deck for a Replenish. I will then play Replenish to draw five new cards. Okay, now I have Fire, Knight, Unrestricted Search Authorized, Replenish, and Scouring for the Right Skills. I'll play Scouring for the Right Skills, of course, to uh, see if I can find a Burning Fist in my deck. It's called Burning Spirit, by the way. Uh, apparently I can't read, but my dyslexia aside, I did find one. I'll play the knight in my hand, of course. I'll use fire on one of my knights. I'll unrestricted search. I grabbed fodder, which is one of my trap cards, which I'm also going to play face down. I'll discard Burning Spirit for Rune Knight's effect, so if I use a Fire Elemental um, Combat card this turn, it gets plus 5. And then I'm going to replenish 5. New hand is going to be two Unrestricted Searches, um, a Fodder Wizard that I don't care about at all that I only have in to meet the deck creating requirements, uh, Scouring Skills, and a Regroup. I'll use one Unrestricted Search. I got Spoils of War, which is a once-per-turn card that lets me draw three. I'll play Scouring Skills to get another Burning Spirit. I'll activate Spoils of War for the draw three. Okay, so I got a Replenish, Scouring Skills, and Ordinance Retrieval. I'm gonna play that Ordinance Retrieval. I'm gonna grab the Big Daddy Deus Crystal. I'm going to play the Deus Crystal. Sacrificing Scouring Skills, Burning Spirit, and the Wizard. My combat cards will deal plus 6 damage now. I'll regroup to shuffle my hand back into my deck. New hand is going to be two regroups, a Replenish, an Unrestricted Search, and a Scouring Prohibited. The Scouring Prohibited is a trap card, so I'll go ahead and just put that face down. Then uh, I'm just going to flat out play another regroup. Shuffle my hand back into my deck and draw five new cards. New hand's gonna be Regroup, Embargo, Fire, Replenish, and Karm. I'm gonna go ahead and just put Embargo face down as my third and last trap card. I keep saying trap, I'm sorry. They're ambush cards, but I'm gonna play it face down as my last ambush. And I'll play Fire on my last night, so now all three of my characters are currently Fire Affinity. I'll... Replenish for three. I got Ice, Unrestricted Search, Authorized, and Ordinance Retrieval. I'll use Ice on my opponent's Paladin, so my opponent's Paladin and Rune Knight are both going to be Ice from now on. I'll use Ordinance Retrieval. I grab Regroup. Now I'll use Karm, discarding my two Regroups. All of my combat cards will cost one less this turn, so my Burning Spirits will be one mana instead of two. I'll then use Unrestricted Search to get yet another Unrestricted Search. Currently one card left in deck, by the way. I'll then use this Unrestricted Search to just get the last card of my deck. The card I get is Replenish. There are currently zero cards in deck. Now, there's a rule that I forgot to talk about before that I'll talk about now. If you have to draw a card and there are no cards in your deck, 
Then you shuffle all the cards in your hand and discard pile together to make a new deck and then draw three cards. I know some of you are having like a schism fit right now because you realize what that means, but uh, let's leave it a surprise for everybody else, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna play this out. I now play Replenish for five. Currently zero cards in deck, so I must perform a deck refresh. I'm going to shuffle my discard pile together with the cards in my hand, which are none. I now get to draw three cards for the deck refresh. The three cards I draw off of my deck refresh are Ordinance Retrieval, Burning Spirit, and Scouring for the Right Skills. I still have five cards floating on Replenish, so I'll draw those now. My cards off of Replenish are Ordinance Retrieval, Ice, Elemental, uh, Unrestricted Search, Replenish, and Regroup. I shall now use an Ordinance Retrieval for the Deos Crystal. I'll then, of course, play my uh, Deos Crystal by discarding three cards here. I'll discard Ice Elemental, Replenish, and Regroup. My combat cards will now be plus 12 this turn. I haven't activated my Knight's abilities yet, so I'll discard Ordinance Retrieval and um, Scouring Skills so that they get plus 5 this turn if they use a combat card that's a warrior type. I'll then use Unrestricted Search to search my deck for a Replenish. Then I'll of course uh, Replenish for 4. Replenish nets me a Scouring for the Right Skills, Burning Spirit, and Fire. I'll scour for another Burning Spirit. Now, I absolutely assure you I could go on and uh, continuously loop this, but since I have three Burning Spirits in my deck, I'm just going to move to the next phase so that I can continue this on and uh, so I don't have to keep animating this crap. Alright, so Battle Phase 2. Pay attention, this is going to get messy. I have two knights, both fire attribute, a rune knight, also fire attribute, I have three burning spirits in my hand, I have two deos crystals boost, so I'm going to get plus 12 on all of my attacks, and because of the elemental boost, I'm going to get another plus 12, and then I'm going to get another plus 5 because of the uh, character's natural abilities. So my first knight is going to use burning spirit, and it targets both of my opponent's characters, and they're both ice, so let's go ahead and add up how much damage my knight is going to deal. This is plus 8, and my knight has a natural 8, so it's going to be 16 so far. The boost from his ability is going to make it 21. Elemental boost is going to be plus 6, and then plus 6 because I'm fighting against an opposing element, so it's going to be 33. And then 2 Deos Crystals is going to make that 45. So this is a grand total of 90 damage to my opponent's field because I'm attacking two characters at once. But uh, we're just going to count it as 45 because it's only 45 for each character. Keep in mind that they have the highest HP of any character that I've seen, and it's 70. So this will leave each of them with 25 HP, and this also only costs 1 mana because of Karm. The Paladin does have an ability that could mitigate some of the damage, but I've run this check a few times, and there's actually a more efficient way to use it, which we'll get into now. So the second knight is going to use another Burning Spirit, and the same thing's going to happen. One mana cost, 45 damage to both. Now, this would normally knock them both out, but the Paladin has a neat interaction where when another character on their side of the field is targeted, the knight can discard one card from its owner's hands to redirect that damage onto itself. So it can actually take the full brunt of the 90 damage itself, since it's going to die anyways, and then just die. The damage is mitigated by 5, so it's only 85, but considering it had a max HP of 70, that's not going to help it much. Now the Rune Knight is sitting alone at 25 HP, there's no longer a way around it, I'm going to go ahead and use my last Burning Spirit with my Rune Knight, which in this case is going to cost 2 mana because there was recently a change to Karm that made it so only pure warrior types can use it. Doesn't matter, I had that 4 mana at the beginning, and I have the 2 left after using the uh, 2 Burning Spirits with my Knights anyway, so I pay 2 and I kill off the Rune Knight. And that was the first turn of the game. Uh, now I guess I can just pass to my opponent, let them take the 140 damage to their Crystal and have 60 left, and let's see what they can do. Here's the nail in the coffin about me going first. I have 3 ambushes in play that are specifically designed to keep my opponent from catching back up to me. Scouring Prohibited is pretty much going to nullify one of their crystals that let them search their deck for a card, like uh, Search Authorized or Ordinance. Embargo flat out just gets rid of a crystal card regardless of what it was, negates it, gets rid of it. 
And fodder is my absolute favorite. If my opponent tries to replenish with no cards in hand, or if at any point they try to play regroup, then they have to play without a hand. Because as soon as they go to draw the cards, I flip over fodder, and all the cards they would have drawn go to the discard pile instead. Again, I want you to keep in mind that after the ridiculous and consistent turn that I just had, I can now make it impossible for my opponent to have a turn as good as mine and sweep the match in the next turn. As you can imagine, this is a bit of a problem. So, here's my concern, is this isn't just one or two very broken cards slipping through the cracks, slipping through playtesting. This entire mechanic of just spamming crystal cards to make a very consistent turn that wipes out your opponent's entire board and then makes it impossible for them to play the next turn is a little bit off. One of the arguments I know some people are going to have is, well, Kudo, you don't have to play like that. Like, you could be an awful mid-maxer and do your best to just play a broken deck and win any card game. Like, you could just ignore all of that stuff and try to have some fun. Guys, I'd like to talk to you about something. It's my personal philosophy on gaming. And I'm not just talking about card games, but I'm talking about video games, board games, any kind of gaming. I really hope you take this to heart. At some point, every game will offer you two different paths. On the one path, you can try to master the game by figuring out what the best possible way to play it is, and continuously pushing bounds within the game's limits and the rules that it provides for you. This is satisfying because you're beating the game despite the rules and boundaries that it sets for you. This is sort of the pro path. On the other side of the path, there's another way you can go, where you knowingly ignore the limits, rules, and boundaries of the game and instead create something that gives you personal enjoyment. We'll call this the fun path. While every game offers these two possibilities, the mark of a truly extraordinary game is when these two paths begin to converge into one another, and pushing the limits and bounds of your own skills within the game becomes the fun part of the game. The secret to good game design is not making the player feel like they have to choose between playing the best way they know possible or playing in a way that's personally fun. And that's the main problem with the game. Honestly, if I were to build decks for this game, it would be the most boring videos of all time, because like 30 to 35 of the cards for every single deck would be exactly the same. In fact, the only things I could think to change up are the combat cards, what elements you want to use, one or two staples, and your unit cards, and that's maybe seven to nine cards right there. Now, obviously, I don't think this was done as some nefarious plot or something. I think this just comes from a lack of experience in game creation. The game was not given to the right people to playtest before its release, and there was not enough communication between the game creator and the audience for the game itself. The elements of a decent game are in here somewhere, but it's kind of like baking a cake where you're technically using the right ingredients, but instead of throwing it in the oven to fully bake, you just kind of sell the dough <laughs> by itself. Like you uh, make gooey cake pops or something. I don't know where I'm going with this analogy. What I'm trying to say is the game feels very unfinished. It almost feels like an alpha of an actual card game that hasn't been released yet. The problem there, of course, being that the game is currently for sale. I'll stand by indie game developers until my dying breath. I understand that it is a very tough thing to get into, and I admire the courage and patience you have to have to get into a field like this. But that being said, I'll always be on the consumer's side as well. You cannot sell a game like this if it is so underdeveloped. And again, I'm not saying anything bad about the creator, I'm not trying to hurt any feelings here, but I have to be honest. Because this game is up for sale for actual money, I have to be as honest as possible, and the game just is not worth the money that it's currently being sold for. In fact, some of these prices are kind of crazy if you think about it. The music CD is... Well, I don't know anything about music. I guess that could be an okay price. Every starter deck is going to be $20, which is double what you would spend on something like a Pokemon starter deck. Every 10-card booster is $8. Now, the booster packs that I got have 11 cards in them, but it doesn't make it much better. And then the poster and the random draw, which I guess are fine. 
but it's just twenty dollars for a starter deck for a game that you don't know anything about is not a good deal for the consumer especially if a couple of them give this game a chance and actually go out and buy a theme deck for themselves um i just can't in good conscience recommend somebody do that with the game being in the current state that it's in and I got on the Eldritch Kingdoms card game about their $8 booster packs too. I'm going to do it here as well. I understand indie developer, there are more costs than there are for somebody like Pokemon or Wizards of the Coast or Bushy Road. But man, $8 for a 10 card booster in a game that hardly anybody knows about is such a hard pill to swallow. At least try to bring it down to like 4 or 5, like 5 absolute most. Now that we've talked about the main issues with the game, I'd like to talk about what if I were the one developing this game are some of the things that I would have considered. Surprisingly, my biggest and main point is going to be the way that the unit cards work. It's kind of a cute idea to have two unit cards in play at the beginning of the game and then search out a third one and you and your opponent don't know what that third one's going to be, but the entire system just feels really clunky. If I were designing a game like this, I think I would rather just have a straight up 3v3 arena battle with my opponent, where we just have three characters that aren't a part of our decks. I'd also prefer if the characters were named, personally. Uh, just having Rune Knight as a card seems a little weird, especially because there's so much lore within the game. Each of the uh, starter deck booklets has like a small lore pamphlet on it, so I don't see why some like names couldn't be added to, like, I don't know... Mark Stavio, the Rune Knight. I'm Mark Stavio. I don't, man, why am I even doing this? If you were worried about one person having one of their characters die and being at a disadvantage because it would be 3v2, there are ways to balance around that. Maybe the player who is down a character gets an extra mana at the beginning of each of their turns. Like, you could just get one extra mana for each of your characters that's fallen. Maybe we could just use crystal points to revive characters. That would be fine. Another idea could be something along the lines of a limit break. So if a character is defeated, they let off one big final skill before they're defeated. So it could be something like giving you a bunch of mana, discarding some cards from your opponent's hand, uh, dealing a bunch of damage, so on and so forth. The point I'm trying to get to here is I don't really like the idea of having unit cards within your deck if they're going to be so immovable because you can only have three in play at a time you start the game with two and once you play that third one you can't do anything about your field until one of the characters dies so it just doesn't really work for me personally i'd also personally look into the way that combat itself works um one thing is i feel like characters should already have elements in uh, some capacity, maybe have defenses against magic attacks or defenses against warrior-based attacks. I know I talked up how simple the game was before, but the game doesn't necessarily have to be quite as simple as it is. Since you're an indie developer, the game doesn't have to be so by the books. You can take a crazy chance and do something to make the game a bit more uh, unique, you know? Um, one thing that I'm surprised is missing here because it gave the original Final Fantasy game some depth is the idea of equipment. I probably would have made the game around having named character cards and building some kind of character stack for each of the characters before we went into battle. So maybe you have like a warrior and then he's allowed like one weapon, one piece of armor and then like a pendant or charm or something. So it could be like a fire pendant to make him fire element and then like maybe you start the game with a fire element card in your hand. Uh, you could have well, your a piece of equipment, uh, sorry, your piece of armor be either like actual armor so that uh, you take less damage or it could be like boots to increase your speed and maybe speed could play in elements like uh, with who gets their next turn and uh, so on. Um, your weapon could be like either a sword that deals fire damage because you have the fire pendant and you uh, start with a fire attack in your hand so that would be pretty nice or maybe it could be like a different kind of weapon like a staff or something that maybe got some kind of other bonus maybe lets you look at the top card of your deck every turn who knows uh the possibilities would really be endless with something like that because everybody could build a character 
based on how they themselves would want the character to interact within the game and then build their own team of characters who interacted with each other in that way. So let's take this idea and push it further. Let's say, for example, we each built a team of three and then when we went in to fight each other, each character had their own speed value, right? So instead of each player taking an, indiv an individual turn, you could list the characters in order of highest speed to lowest speed, and then that character itself got a turn every time it came up on the list. So if you had really fast characters, you got to act first, but they would be slightly weaker, have less HP, they would be like the ninja, so on and so forth. But maybe characters lower on the list have a bit better stats. So then you could say, man, I don't know if I want to give this character boots, to increase their speed and so uh, you make them a little bit faster and make them go higher on the list or maybe you just ignore that give them like I don't know a piece of armor that uh, lets them protect against uh, physical attacks or like some kind of cloak or something that lets them protect protect against magic attacks um, your charm could be something like uh, Either it gives you a little bit of speed, or it gives you an element, or it uh, lets you interact with your deck in some way. Maybe it lets you discard a card and draw a new card every turn, or whatever, you know. This is me literally just coming up with ideas and spitballing, and I have a feeling this is the way that a game like this should have gone in the first place. Not to say that what's here is necessarily bad, but again, it just feels very underdeveloped because it's so simple and so easily broken. Especially because the game is marketed to an older Final Fantasy JRPG NES SNES fan, it would have only improved the game to have included more things that were similar to things you would have found there. Uh, the inclusion of maybe level systems, maybe uh, characters could have multiple levels that they level up throughout the, uh, the course of the game. Um, equipment is something I already mentioned. Um, maybe you could find a way to include monsters, the idea of limit breaks that I said before. There's so much missing that if this game just had a little bit more time to bake, I think you could have found some ideas to make this game truly something extraordinary. But as it stands, it's just a really basic card game that needs a lot of fixing. Also, am I the only one who thinks it's weird that this game has crystal cards and crystal points, but they don't interact with each other at all? It's so weird that crystal cards don't cost crystal points or something. Though, to be honest, the crystal points are something that I don't think I would have included with my version of the game at all. The points I was just making are a bit moot, because they would require changing the game up so much that you would essentially be making a completely new game at this point, and the game is done. It's not being developed, it's a game that is currently printed and shipped, and people have it already, and there's really not much you could implement from what I was saying into the game in its current state. Um, the reason that I wanted to point them out, though, is it's it really shows what the game could potentially have been if the game were given a bit more development time, and if there was some more interaction between the creators of the game and the community to see if there was anything they could have changed before the game was done. What I'm going to talk about now are some things that I think the game can do moving forward with its current model to become a better game. We'll just get the crystal thing out of the way. They're way too powerful. Some very, very strict limits need to be set on them. A certain number of turn would help. Um, having them cost crystal points would help. Uh, setting a limit on types of crystal cards that can be played, like you can only play one replenish or regroup per turn, so on and so forth, yada yada. Another neat fix that I thought about was you know, you could probably get away with not doing anything to the crystal points if you just updated the rules. The idea of getting to the end of your deck and then getting to reshuffle your deck and draw three cards is a little bit ludicrous. Um, you could easily implement a system where, like, if you did get to the end of your deck and you had to shuffle and draw three cards, it just flat out ended your turn. Then there could be a bit of strategy because, you know, how many cards do I have left in my deck? Do I want to try and go two more turns without going through the deck refresh, or do I maybe want to force myself into it a turn early and give up my turn this turn? Um, there could be some interesting things there. The only problem there is there are also cards um, that let you shuffle your discard pile back into your deck anyways. 
By the way, one thing I want to point out is uh, there might be a comment from the creator below saying something about not being able to uh, deck refresh in the way that I did in my example because there is nothing that specifically states that you do that, but there is a rule that says at the beginning of your turn to when you go to draw a card, if you don't have any cards, that's the action that you do, and then you continue your turn afterwards. So, uh, since there's nothing else in the rulebook about what happens when you run out of cards in your deck, I'm assuming that's what happens, but even if it doesn't, um, again, there's a card in the starter deck that just straight out lets you shuffle your discard pile back into your deck for free, so it doesn't invalidate any of the strategy that I used within the demonstration. So yeah, while I don't think uh, making some kind of harsher penalty for having to deck refresh would necessarily fix the problems with the crystal cards, I do think it might be a good start if you do that and then maybe just put a kibosh on any of the cards that let you shuffle your discard pile back into your deck. And um, yeah, I mean, you could really take it from there. Unit cards, again, uh, feel a bit clunky. I think you should at least include some that have a bit higher HP, because once unit cards are in play, they can't go anywhere. So um, you might as well make them a bit beefier and at least sort of add a bit of a strategy there. Make some with like 100 or 120 HP, and I think that would at least make the unit cards a bit more um, noticeably impactful, if that makes any sense. Um, I do think some of them should start having names pretty soon. I do think some of them should start having elements pretty soon. I think the idea of splitting them specifically between warriors and mages was a bit of a mistake because there's so many other things that you could include. Um, maybe a dagger for rogues or uh, maybe like some kind of like dark eyes or something for um, warlocks or... I'm getting kind of in like World of Warcrafty here, but what I'm trying to say is I wish there was a bit more depth within the units. Um, right now, it's very difficult to break away from just straight out using the units that give you an extra 5 damage on your attacks, because they're kind of the best. I will give a special mention here to the ninja card, and um, the creator might have also said something about the ninja card in the comments below. You should definitely go and check, but the reason that I didn't use the ninja in my demonstration is because... Even if you use the ninja's effect, by the way, I should probably point out what the ninja's effect is, the ninja's effect lets you discard two cards from your hands to negate the damage from an attack. Even if you did use the ninja in that instance instead of the rune knight, um, you could technically create a scenario where the ninja lives and the paladin still dies, and um, when you go into your next turn, your opponent just doesn't have a hand, because <laughs> they would have to discard for the ninja twice to negate all of the damage, and then the paladin dies, so they would literally have zero cards in their hands during their very first turn. And considering I've got those three traps in play that stop them from doing literally anything with crystal cards, um, I really don't see how that would have been a more viable solution, because on my next turn I would have just killed them anyways. Trust me, I thought the ninja was the way out of the loop too, but it's just not. Combat cards are fine for the most part. It's really the combat of the game itself that holds the combat cards back a little bit. And something else I want to point out is the mages just clearly have better cards. I, I really don't understand the point of that. Like, let me put in a comparison up here. Dancing Blades, 2, 2 mana. It doesn't have any elements, so you're not going to get the plus 12 bonus if you play around the elemental cards. Uh, and it just deals 10 damage to two targets, that's it. Twister, also two mana, hits three targets, deals one less damage, but also discards an ambush card. And let's not forget, because it goes into the elemental cycle, I can give this plus six damage by making my character wind, and another six damage if I make my target earth. So, this deals 21 damage to three targets. It's a total of 63 damage. Uh, kind of makes the 20 damage you get from the other card look like an overturned porta potty but maybe that's just me. Another thing I want to point out is the uh, one-cost combat cards are pretty much useless. They're completely worthless. They're wastes of space in your deck because Karm and Magus are so easy to pull off 
that um, all of your two cost cards are always just going to be one cost cards anyways. So there's really no reason for one cost cards to exist. They're honestly not even that much better and considering uh, most of the two cost cards at least hit multiple targets. Seems like a small thing at first, but then you realize like a one cost card deals like eight damage and um, to one target and then a two cost card deals 10 damage to two targets. So it's technically dealing 20 damage which is over double for just one more mana. Um, mana is so easy to get that even if you were to come out with like a Mana Surge 3, people would probably still play it because discarding three cards from your hand is nothing. So yeah, um, if Karm and Magus are going to stay things, then uh, you need to do something about how powerful two cost combat cards are because right now they're just way too good and they're even better than some three cost cards in my opinion. Finally, let's talk about the Ambush cards. I really don't have much of a problem with the Ambush cards. I think they're fine, with the exception of one rule. You should not be able to play Ambush cards if you're going first. That is just so unfair, because you can go through all of these crystal cards and do all these crazy combos, and then your opponent just can't do any of it, because you can instantly negate three crystal cards. And uh, you can even potentially put them in a spot where they don't have a hands to play with. That's just way too much power for a player going first to have. In fact, players going first have literally zero disadvantages in this game. They still get to draw a card, they still get their mana at the beginning of the turn, they still get to attack, and they get to set their ambush cards before their opponent even has a chance to take a turn. It's a little bit too much, man. I would definitely consider making some kind of rule against playing ambush cards if you're the player going first, or at least limiting them to maybe one. And finally, nothing card specific, but just some game stuff. Uh, again, definitely look for some slightly better playtesters. I have a feeling you play tested with people you know, which is a huge no-no if you're going into a market like this. Try to find people who play like Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering players are like the truffle pigs of broken stuff in games. They play a game where Jace the Mind Sculptor is a card that was printed and played. They know all about broken cards. Now, there is a deck in Magic the Gathering that wins the game before your opponent has even taken a turn or the game itself is even started yet. If there's something broken within your game, they'll be able to find it. A bit more communication and um, a bit better playtesting, and I think this game isn't too far gone, and it can still come back and be a really great card game. Heck, come to me! Come to the Kudokun community! I've got plenty of people in Discord that would help you playtest as a game, or at least look over the cards for you to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. But anyways, I need to start wrapping this baby up. This is nearly an hour long. I was planning on it being half an hour long, but of course I, uh, I went a little bit overboard with my, uh, <laughs> went a little bit overboard and long-winded with my explanations, but that's what always happens. So I want to say one more time that none of this was meant to make the creator feel bad. Um, I just, I, I want to make the games as good as possible, especially because it's an indie game. Honest criticism is something that I don't think this game truly had enough of when it was being developed, and somebody needs to come by and just be really honest and thorough about whether or not the game works. And so much of this game just doesn't work and needs to be fixed as soon as possible in order for this game to survive. I really hope I was able to do that without coming off as too big of a dick. But you never know with things like this. I guess if I was a little bit of a jerk, people can tell me in the comment section below. But if they enjoyed it, they could also leave this video a like. They could subscribe to stay up to date on the latest Kudo news and leave me comments on what I should cover next. And they should also stay tuned to the special treat we have at the end of the video. If you'd like to prove to me that you made it to the end of the video, then please leave me the name of one of the cards in the card pack opening that we're going to be doing right after this. And I will see you guys next time. Hey you guys, really hope you enjoyed the video. I uh, hope I didn't come off as too harsh, obviously that wasn't my intention, but we're going to go ahead and open up these two booster packs now. Thank you again for waiting till the end of the video. Uh, keep in mind this is about $16 worth of cards, so... Uh, let's hope that I eat my words a little bit about the pricing. First of all, these are fairly high quality packages. Um, I can't believe they got sent in something quite as nice as this. It's fully foiled, it's holographic. It's a really, really nice looking booster pack, so 
let's go ahead and open one of these bad boys up. You guys have waited through quite a long video to get to this part, so uh, let's let's just dig right in, shall we? Oh, oh man, I was really hoping to keep one of the booster packs intact. Whew, we'll have to try with that one. All right, let's see. Mana pressure. Uh, when a unit attempts to play a combat card, you may send the up to three cards from your hand to the discard pile for each card. The mana cost of all combat cards increases by one until the end of the turn. All right, all right, so not bad, not bad. Uh, wouldn't main deck it, of course, but neato. Revenge removal. If someone attempts to place an ambush card on the field, send the card to the discard pile instead. All right, you got it. Hunt for traps. Uh, search deck for traps. You got it. Fire elemental. We are part way through building our deck, boys. A cleric. Snake strike. Seven damage for two mana, and it inflicts poison. Frost. Uh, if you remember from my review, this is the weaker of the two cards that we talked about involving the elements, but okay. Weird flex. Pummel, one for four. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, <laughs> this is show kind of showcasing uh, one of the points that I was making in the video. Um, really, no reason for both of these to exist. But all right, all right, we'll stick with it. Disabling illusion, inflict four HP of damage and paralysis. Uh, one thing I. I I mean, you can obviously see, but these are fairly high quality cards. These are going to last a pretty long time. Uh, you can see from the shine on them and from the fact that they have a bit of a rigid surface that uh, these could honestly have been made by a much bigger company. So kudos to them for how high quality their cards are. Palporo Library. Uh, you can search your deck for a lore relic, essentially, and that's going to be... Um, the crystal cards actually so Deus crystal and um, the other cards that essentially say crystal or crystal shard in their name and then finally we've got a scavenge so take one card from your discard pile and place it in your hand reshuffle the remaining cards back into your deck oh uh oh uh oops um yeah no that's bullcrap that's uh that's not good <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, that's a little bit of a problem, too. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, if I scavenge into a, um, into a regroup, uh, that's gonna make the loop even worse. Um, okay. Well, I mean, I've already gone over all the points that I had to make. We're just gonna set this to the side here. Also, I apologize for the noise. Holy crap, guys. Calm down out there. Sheesh. Can a boy make a living? All right, looks like this one's going to uh, gonna be a little dead too, but that's okay. I think the real high quality booster pack we have is the friends we made along the way. Oh yeah, this one, this one's dead. I'm definitely gonna have to keep the other one as a souvenir. All right, let's see what we got here. Oh, and noise, wonderful. Again, it would not be a Kudo Kun video if it did not have audio problems of some kind. We've got the Corona Tornado, uh, which is absolutely hysterical, considering Corona is a type of beer here in America. So, inflict 9 HP of damage and send one of the target's ambush cards to the discard pile. Oh, goody. That's neat. It's fire. I think I saw a wind element version of this, too, but I'll have to double check and make sure. Halo Flash, uh, 1 for 10, Light Element. Um, that's a little too much damage. Holy crap. 10 HP of damage. That makes it probably the strongest one-cost elementals that I've seen so far. Interesting. Uh, search a deck for a uh, character card. Uh, probably never going to use something like this, although I guess I could tech one in to make, um, to make it a little more consistent, because... Uh, since we have a wizard that we can throw away pretty much continuously, uh, this would never really be that dead of a card in our hand. Revive. 
Send one card from your hand to the discard pile. Search your discard pile for any unit cards. Choose one, plays into your hand. Shuffle the remaining unit cards into your deck. Um, I don't see this card being broken, so, I mean, that's a start. It's pretty good. Another cleric. We're going to be absolutely up to our eyeballs and clerics here. Another Palapora Library. All right. Trap Breaker. Send one of the target's ambush cards to the discard pile. I mean, I really... <laughs> I, I'm trying not to make too many comparisons between Yu-Gi-Oh! trap cards and ambush cards, but, uh, I mean, it's really tough when the card that targets ambush cards is called the Trap Breaker. You know what I mean? Kind of weird. <laughs> uh, Thunder Punch. Once again, this is, uh... This is a bit of an unfortunate, uh showing of how much more powerful the um, the spellcasters are than the warriors. Uh, again, one cost uh, deals 7 HP worth of damage, and it is elemental, it's lightning elemental, but uh, if I remember correctly here, Halo Flash, which is a light elemental, uh, deals 10, exact same cost. Um, again, bit unfortunate there. Uh, Mana Surge 2. And check it out, a Mana Surge 1, uh, pretty much right next to it. Uh, so, Mana Surge for, wait a second, oh, no, 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 oh, no, 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 I said, oh my gosh, uh, this isn't Mana Surge 2, it's Mana Surge 3, oh, uh, uh-oh, <laughs> well, yes, now I can put my money where my mouth is, because I did say during the video, that you could easily run a Mana Surge 3, and it would still be just as good, if not better. So, uh, I guess I can update the, uh... <laughs> oh my gosh. I guess I can update the old deck list with a uh, Mana Surge 3 instead of a Mana Surge 2. Finally, Assist. Choose an ally. For this turn, it may use the unit ability of any other ally rather than its own. Um, uh-oh, that, that one sounds pretty bad, too. Uh-oh. All right, so what I'm thinking with this is if you were actually to run this in a deck with the ninja, what you could do is uh, you could give the ninja um, your knight or your rune knight's ability to get extra, um, how to say, you, you could get more utility out of your ninja essentially because the ninja doesn't really have an effect during your turn so you could use assist to give the ninja the plus five boost that your knight or your rune knight's getting and then on your opponent's turn you can just uh get the ninja's regular ability back so it, it, this essentially makes your ninja unstoppable uh very interesting card here and that is it boys that is that's your uh that's your sixteen dollar lot right there Ooh boy so anyways uh this is the actual end of the video thank you again so much for watching another huge thank you to the creator of the warriors of the crystal card game uh, really really enjoyed doing this video i'm sorry it took so long to get out and with that out of the way more kudo kudo content on the way i don't know why i said kudo kudo i meant to say kudo kun and we're gonna go ahead and end this video before i embarrass myself even more so catch you later youtube